um, I bear witness to you that today, if you're quiet inside, if you'll be reverent and be prayerful, the Spirit of the Holy Ghost will speak to you. My prayer is that you can take a subject that might be a little bit scholarly and still have a real revelatory experience. There are three words that I think are uh, really kind of underlying great teaching. One, messages that you listen to and experience should be rele relevant to your personal life. Who agrees? It needs to be relevant to you. Two, it should resonate with your soul. You should feel something about it in your mind and your heart. And then finally, when you have that experience, if you will say, Heavenly Father, I think you're teaching me something, if you'll then go heavenward and say, I really want to know more. <laughs> kind of like a missionary experience, the Holy Ghost is knocking on the door and saying, I'm ready to teach you something. Then if you'll say, Heavenly Father, I'm listening. Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. Then more insights will come. And I testify, look, they'll come to you with increasing frequency and intensity by the power of the Holy Ghost, if you're engaging your mind and your heart. We're going to be talking about the Dead Sea Scrolls, intertestamental literature. Big words, what does that mean? Intertestamental, what's that time period? Someone just raise your hand and help us here, quickly. Christian? Information between the Old and New Testament. Good, information between the Old and New Testament. And the Dead Sea Scrolls are actually our largest library of texts having to do with a time period between <clears throat> the Old and New Testament. There are oldest Old Testament manuscripts uh, that are most extant, the largest collection that we have. Does that make sense? And I'm psyched because in there is this wonderful Isaiah scroll. And you know the Savior loves Isaiah, right? And there's this wonderful Enoch scroll. Who here loves Enoch? And then there is also what they call the Copper Scroll, which I'm kind of psyched about. And it's on the cover of the, the uh, full text of the Dead Sea Scrolls, if any of you want this, this is in the book cell, but just it's kind of fun <laughs> to find some little insights. This guy's name is Giza Vermes. That is a cool name, okay? Um, and he actually has the best English translation of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And on the cover it is that copper scroll. Uh, is anybody in here already know what's on the copper scroll? Okay, who here has a little Indiana Jones in you? Who here has a little treasure hunter in you? The copper scroll is actually a list of all of the things they hid when the temple was sacked, 68 to 70 AD, uh, so the Romans couldn't find the cool stuff. Does that make sense? There were scrolls and papyrus, okay, and parchments, and actually 25 talents of gold, 70 talents of silver, and they were hidden, and it's a map of all that. So who thinks the copper scroll is kind of fun? And how cool is this? They've never found any of it. None of it. So there's an adventure for you in the future. Orrin, quick question? By the time of Jesus, had any of the law of Moses been lost? Any of like the original texts or things that Adam? Noah we are going to cover that. That's a great question. We already have, from the time period of the King Josiah, we have a group called the Deuteronomists. Who anybody know that Josiah was a righteous king and a boy king, maybe eight years old, and he sent Hilkiah the scribe into the temple and said, "If I'm going to govern, I want to govern with the word of God." And they took the scrolls out of the temple and read them. <clears throat> and already there were many apostate practices amongst the Israelites. And so in trying to cleanse uh, corruption, they actually ended up taking out pretty sacred things out of the scriptures already and out of the law of Moses. So if you want to look up the Deuteronomist, look up a woman by the name of Margaret Barker, who's done a lot of research. She's spoken here at Utah State. Remember last year? Anybody hear her lecture? Phenomenal little lady. I had lunch with her. Has this great English accent. I would go to lunch with her just to hear her talk. It was <laughs> delightful soul. And... Uh, she actually has pointed out that Melchizedek and temple theology is all through the most ancient texts. And a lot of that's lost. So today we're going to maybe put back some of what was lost by looking at how Heavenly Father preserved the Dead Sea Scrolls to come forth uh, in the late 1940s, early 1950s, and really doesn't get published and really put in the hands of the common individual tell our generation. So kind of fascinating. What was the Lord doing with these manuscripts that eventually will be compared to the writings of the Book of Mormon, the Joseph Smith translation, King James Version, and you'll find that Joseph Smith's inspiration in the Book of Mormon matches the oldest manuscripts in the Dead Sea Scrolls, but doesn't match the King James. Almost like Joseph Smith knew stuff that nobody else on earth knew. Hmm, that's interesting. Okay, so quickly here, I gave you my little uh, idea of this needs to resonate, be relevant, and a 
allow for revelatory experience. Would someone read just the middle quote here from Elder Maxwell? If you feel like you'd like to do that and you have an erudite voice, use your most intelligent voice. Go. Elder, you can giggle. If you want. <laughs> Elder Neil A. Maxwell has affirmed, if there is sometimes too little respect for the life of the mind, it is a localized condition and is not institutional in character. The Lord sees no conflict between faith and learning in a broad curriculum. The scriptures see faith and learning as mutually facilitating, not separate processes. Elder Patrick, each of us must accommodate the mixture of reason and revelation in our lives. The gospel not only permits it, but requires it. If you understand those two thoughts, raise your hand. Who gets that? What am I trying to... Andrew, please. Just that, that we have to understand the gospel by learning and also by faith. And that revelation through that faith, that it's got to be a, a spiritual and an intellectual pursuit. Excellent. So teach ye out of the best, you know, scripture, right? Books. By study and faith is how we should learn. In your mind and in your heart. So hopefully today we'll engage your mind and your heart as we discuss these things. And again, uh, Elder Woodstow put it this way, uh, that evidence can remove honest doubt. And give assurances that build faith. How many of you have had someone with a faith crisis over Joseph Smith's plural wives, uh, blacks in the priesthood, uh, the book of Abraham, anything like that? The same gender issue. But raise your hand side. Let me see. How many of you have had that question? How many of you would love to have just a soundbite that's powerfully true, that is backed up by statistics and reason, that spiritually feels right to give your friends? That's what we're working on in this setting, to talk about the scriptures in a way that would give people a chance to dissuade their doubts by having some, some facts behind their thoughts, okay? After proper inquiries using all the powers at our command, he said, the weight of evidence is on one side or the other, doubt is then removed. Doubt of the right kind, though, that is honest, questioning, actually leads to faith. How many of you have had a question when you got an answer? It built your testimony. And you had a stronger witness after that. So it's okay to wonder or ask questions. That's how Joseph Smith got his experience, right? It was with really serious questions uh, that didn't align with what his parents were doing, okay? Um, honest questioning leads to faith and opens the door to truth. For where there is doubt, faith cannot thrive. We're going to try to cover eight things, maybe ten if we really push it, okay, uh, about the Dead Sea Scrolls, who found them, where they were found, who wrote them, uh, what, uh, what is written on them, then the, we're going to really focus on Isaiah and the Dead Sea Scrolls and a, and a thing called the Messianic Apocalypse, which is from Cave 4, and they call it... If you see a Q in front of one of my references, that means Qumran, okay? And it'll, it'll, like have, it'll have like 4Q, that means Cave 4 from Qumran is where it came from, and then it'll give a number of the fragments. Does that make sense? So if I quote fragments, you may want to make a note of that so you know it's going to have the cave first, then Q for Qumran, and then it'll have the fragment number beside it. Okay, um, Then we'll do the Book of Enoch a little bit, some specific LDS perspectives on the Dead Sea Scrolls. They've been studying them for a generation and have great insights to share with us, uh, uh, LDS scholars. And then if we get lucky, we'll get to the bonus features. Okay, uh, This is what I started with. It needs to be relevant to you. It should resonate, and it should lead to a revelatory experience as you teach throughout your life. Do you remember those three things? I think that makes a difference. I've been teaching 35 years. I'm convinced that... Good teaching always has those three aspects. Now, as you seek for spiritual knowledge, search for principles. Carefully separate them from the detail used to explain them. Principles are concentrated truth, packaged for application to a wide variety of circumstances. How can you study an ancient, non-biblical text and fill the Holy Ghost? Easily. Because the Holy Ghost can bear testimony of what? Always. Of truth. So you'll, you, your spirit will resonate with truth. Okay? Um, who found them? No, it was not who... Although, just so you know, half of them were found by scholars, okay, the caves that they were in, and half of them were found by Bedouin shepherds and just treasure seekers. So there's hope for you, okay, if you want to okay. search out and find some of these fragments I have in my pocket just for fun. I think I brought them. Uh, I know someone who owns one of the kibbutz right there, and I have gone in there and I found some actual pottery from the time period that I had authenticated, and they let me keep them because I have some friends in the Israeli Antiquities Authority who say, yeah, we got lots of that stuff, so you can have that. So if you want to take a look at actual Dead Sea Scrolls uh, pottery, woo, okay, there you go. 
You can take a look at those afterwards. So there's a little Indiana Jones in me, too. Who found them? Someone read this for us. Uh, Ryan, do you want to read this first slide in the spring of? Sure. In the spring of 1947, according to one version of the story of the three Bedouin shepherds from the Timiri tribe, one tending their flocks at the Wadi Qumran, one of them, Juma Muhammad Khalil. You did that well. Juma. Okay, that was good. Go ahead. <laughs> he threw a rock into one of the numerous caves in the region, ostensibly to chase out a wandering goat, and shattered something in the darkness. The boy came crashing down the hill in terror of a jinn, later to be a clay jar. Okay, what's a jinn? He thought it was a. A genie. And with all due reverence, I know we had fun with that name, but Muhammad is a sacred name, isn't it? Uh, in fact, Muhammad the prophet to those of the Islamic faith, that's a very sacred topic. And it's interesting to me that our Heavenly Father has someone of that faith find the Dead Sea Scrolls. I have often called those of the Arabic, Palestinian, and the Islamic family are cousins in the covenant. Does that sound okay to you? Because they were descendants of who as well? Abraham. And someday we will have the chance to take the gospel to them. I'm excited about that. I have a lot of Islamic friends. I've had a few who've attended my classes, came to my family's house for Christmas. Doesn't that sound interesting? Okay, and they wanted to know what a traditional Christmas was. We had one, he, he actually rolled out his prayer rig and prayed for my wife and children with such tenderness. I will love his soul forever. And his name was Muhammad, okay? They often have that name. And uh, he actually played, I had him dress up as a Bedouin shepherd at my home. And when we, I was bishop at the time. We went from house to house delivering gifts from the ward to families in need. And he knocked on the door. He was actually from Bethlehem and said, I am a wise man from Bethlehem bearing gifts. And he, he was. Anyway, <laughs> so that was kind of fun. Um, a couple of days later, after they, you know, chased the goat, and thanks to a goat, look at that. Shout out for goats, okay? Chased a goat into the cave, threw a rock in there to get it out. He actually broke a clay jar, found that there was um, about 10 of these uh, clay pots that were in there, and uh, eight of them were empty. Two of them had, look at this, a copy of the book of Isaiah. And the Lord delights in the writings of Isaiah, right? I think he preserved that there. For a reason. It would later be compared to the Book of Mormon Isaiah and King James Isaiah, and scholars would say, looking at the writings of Joseph Smith, that plowboy got it right. How did he match exact wording to the oldest texts that we have from the Dead Sea Scrolls? That's just a little thought. Also, the Manual of Discipline for the community of the Essenes, who were the people who wrote the scrolls, that was in there, okay? And how their community was to be governed. Where was it found? You all know the word. Where was it? Qumran, okay? And you can see Qumran is on the uh, north and uh, west side of the Dead Sea. Can you see Jerusalem here off the side? Jericho, Bethlehem. All of this uh, side of the Dead Sea has caves all the way down to Nahal Khibar and Bar Kokhba's caves and Masada. There's a, eventually they'll find, uh, they, most of the things you'll read will say 11 caves. Now they've found about 13 caves in which they have found material artifacts shoes, leftover food, a little virgin lamp type thingies, and these clay jars that have had manuscripts in them. And they found up to, get this, um, 971 different manuscripts have been found. Uh, tens of thousands of little fragments. Talk about the biggest jigsaw puzzle on planet Earth. How'd you like to put that all back together with dirt and dust and, and all the years of wear on them? Uh, if you were to go aerial, I jumped up in the air and took the shot for you. I really can, Sky. Um, and uh, this kind of shows the ruins of the city uh, that was there, the community that wrote the scrolls. You can see on this end, cave number four. Um, so in this shot, you can see kind of a, a reconstructive model of how it would have looked at the time. Uh, they're from about... 200 BC, okay, up to just about the time of the, uh, <clears throat> the, the time that Israel was sacked by the Romans, 68, 70 AD is kind of the time period, so intertestamental and a little bit after Christ time as well. If you go to the Dead Sea, you can <laughs> put black mud on your side, she's thrown that up there, that's scary. Um, who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls? Emma, would you read this one? Yeah. Uh, in Qumran, was home to a community of Jewish ascetics. ascetics called the Essenes, who devoted their lives to writing and preserving sacred texts. 
They were hard at work by the time Jesus began preaching. Ultimately, they stored the scrolls in 11 plus caves before Romans destroyed their settlement in AD 68. Now, we believe the Essenes actually are a break off from the groups that are like the Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees. And because they saw corruption in temple worship, and, or and back to your comment, okay, changes in the Mosaic law, they wanted to return to some kind of purity. So they go to the desert. They have ritual purification daily in these what look like baptismal fonts or bathtubs, okay? And they work endlessly, laboriously, transcribing all of the words of Scripture and commentaries called uh, Pesher, okay? Or Pesherim, a lot o'clock. of them. And they, they, they took those and hid them in a place they'd be dry and safe uh, for a couple thousand years. It almost sounds like who? Protecting Scripture. Scratch my chin. Mm-hmm. Who else protected metal plates? Levi historians. Yeah. And, and, and Moroni buries them and prays over them. I, I don't want you to see these people as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of early day saints. They were not. They are a Jewish uh, sect who are responding to corruption basically in the priesthood. Remember that the high priest in Jesus' day had bought his calling from the Romans. How many think... Hmm. He had bought his calling. His name was Annas, and his son Caiaphas, you've heard that name, did the same. In fact, we think Caiaphas may have actually had a dungeon in his house. He was the temple president in his day where he tortured people. So are we looking at corruption? What do you think? Elder McConkie, when he talks about the trials of Jesus, he called them the incarnate devils of the Sanhedrin. That's pretty dramatic. So these people have become wicked, and this group has tried to separate themselves from that wickedness, uh, what was written on the Dead Sea Scrolls? Some estimates say 800, some say 972 manuscripts, 25,000 plus fragments. Who likes puzzles? Okay, people worked on them for 50 years until finally they realized, of course, they were made of leather. What technology was developed during your lifetime that could tell what animal that came from? What kind of research? Yeah, DNA studies. So they were able to do DNA, uh, take little fragments off of these, do a DNA study, and then they had the same animal they could put the pieces at least in a pile. Does that make sense? And then with the help of the Israel Antiquities Authority, scholars from all over the world, Brigham Young University, they digitized them all and let the computers do a lot of the work. How many think? Score. Okay, easy. You're, if you've done it with your puzzles at home, wouldn't many reasons to do the puzzle. Anyway. Um, <laughs> But they found pottery shards, like I'm showing you, clay pots, material artifacts. Uh, The composition of them is uh, 400 manuscripts of just kind of Jewish literature. Some are previously known. 200 of them are biblical. That is a large scriptural library, isn't it? 200 manuscripts that are biblical. And then 200 sectarian compositions. That's kind of what it looked like, the work, for a long time. Can you see that? Looking at all those scroll, fr- uh, those, uh, uh, scroll fragments, uh, there's two guys in there. How many people did you really need? Uh, you need somebody with DNA research and a computer to figure it out. And that, that's eventually what they do. Of these, you need supposed 972 manuscripts found at Qumran. Uh, primarily, there were two separate formats, uh, as scrolls and as fragments of previous uh, scrolls and texts. In the cave number four, there were torn pieces of 15 fragments in one cave. Who here would be overwhelmed? And yet, we owe a debt to these scholars who many of them gave their whole life studying this. So we could eventually say, oh, Joseph Smith was surely a prophet because his writings in so many places match what we found in these ancient manuscripts that weren't known in his day. Is that kind of cool? So I'm grateful for them. What was there? Someone read this slide for us. Who would like to do that? Someone hasn't read yet. Please, go ahead. Here. Number of biblical manuscripts found in the Dead Sea Scroll Torah. That were, they were Torah, so the first five books of Moses. Go ahead. So Genesis 15, Exodus 17, Leviticus 13, Numbers 18, and De- Deuteronomy 20. Which book did these Essenes like the best? Deuteronomy, which is kind of a summary of the last three major sermons of Moses, but it also has much of the law of Moses, as you were talking about, and then would have in purity a lot of the doctrine that was changed. For example, the anthropomorphic nature of God, the fact that God has a what? 
a body was often changed. Many of his names were taken, taken out. Joseph Smith uses a name in the Pearl Great Press. I'll show you here in a minute a fragment that actually has the name Man of Holiness in the Enoch Scroll. But that's not found anywhere in the King James. And it's not found in lots of other scrolls and fragments that are found other places. But Joseph Smith nailed it. He calls God a man of holiness. And it matches his Enoch writings and his teachings during the Restoration. I just think that's phenomenal. So as you look at this doctrinal debris, you have to kind of have an eye for the truths that are mixed in. Uh, notice here, what's the other number one book that these Essenes seem to love? Absolutely love Psalms. Are you all aware that there is uh, 121 different references from the Psalms in the New Testament pretty much that Jesus Christ quotes? And then he makes a statement and says, all the words of Moses, the writings of the prophets, and the Psalms will be fulfilled. So the Savior loved the Psalms. When he sang in him, at what moment? Remember that phrase? He, they sang in him before they went where? Say it louder. To Gethsemane. Have you ever wondered what they sang? It probably wasn't the poor wayfaring man of grief. Even though that would have been very appropriate. Okay? And, you know, the big reveal where it's really the Savior being talked about in him, right? Uh, no, it's the Psalms because the Psalms were often messianic and they spoke of him. Would that give you comfort if you found scriptures that spoke about you and your ministry and your offering? So they love the Psalms. Okay? And then, of course... What's the, the book of the prophets they wrote about the most? Uh, can we give them an air bump for that? <laughs> Boom. They loved Isaiah. The prophets. What does Nephi say? He delighted in the words of Scripture. He loved Isaiah. He loved to liken them to us, to make it relevant to us. If you don't yet have a passion for Isaiah, can I invite you in the name of Jesus Christ throughout your life? Will you study Isaiah? Because Jesus actually made it a commandment in 3 Nephi. Remember that? I command you to study the writings of Isaiah. If you've not yet got that passion, can I invite you to prayerfully consider that? And another, why should I read Isaiah? Begin the study and let him tutor you. They loved Isaiah. Uh, oh, here's a picture. I just wanted to see a photograph of this. This is the copper scroll, okay, be, being shown to you. It looks like it's actually made of copper. Peter? Sorry, uh, just a quick question on some of those uh, biblical scrolls. Yeah. How many of those are actual manuscripts, and how many of those are kind of commentaries on the scriptures? That's a great question. Uh, the, the commentaries are called Pesher, and, and they have almost as many commentaries as they have scriptural scrolls. Okay. Okay? There, there's a lot of commentary, which I was kind of fascinated by, because that's kind of how they reasoned about the scriptures 200 B.C. up to the time of Christ. So that's kind of a fascinating thing to kind of look at. Um, I just wanted to show you this because it's, it's also evidence that Joseph Smith, the prophet of God, was speaking prophetically and historically accurate about what kind of plates were left in Jerusalem that he and his brothers went to get. What do we call them? Plates of brass. The plates of brass. Does everybody know that the, the copper scroll is not really uh, co just copper. It's mixed with uh, tin. And the brass or bronze is... is uh, is copper mixed with zinc and some other alloys and so on, uh, and nickel. And so interestingly enough, Joseph Smith was right. They actually had this kind of metal scroll at the time of Christ. And we can show evidence now of a, there, there's actually a silver scroll that was called Ketep Hinnom. It's actually found on the hillside by Jerusalem um, from 586 B.C. And it's metal plates, silver plates, with Hebrew script on it. Why does that matter to us? What time does Lehi leave Jerusalem? Say it louder, please. Yeah, at that very time when we're already finding metal plates. So here's two evidences of Scripture being written on metal plates. I don't know about you, that kind of makes me excited to know. These are evidences that can help our witness to say, yeah, Joseph Smith got that right. And people have argued for generations that that wasn't really what we found, but... Here's the cool thing. Most of this stuff has been discovered since the 1950s up to the present. So Joseph Smith couldn't even know he was going to get it right. Anyway, just kind of fun. That's what it looked like when they found it. Okay? A little work to do. They didn't dare completely unroll it. It would destroy them, so they cut them up into pieces. They're actually kept at the museum in Amman, Jordan. So if you go to Petra sometime with me, we'll go see those. Okay? It's kind of cool. That's the 
a scroll that has what on it again? A light in your eyes should, should ding. What is it? The treasure. That's a treasure map of the temple treasures, okay? That was there, okay? Uh, one of the most intriguing manuscripts from Qumran is this copper scroll, a sort of ancient treasure map that lists dozens of gold and silver caches. It hasn't been found. I thought before we get into more details about the Dead Sea Scrolls, you should know what existed and what mankind knew before them. Does that make sense? Like what was known before they made this discovery? Kenyon, do you mind reading this right side over here? Before the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, 586 BC, Silver Scrolls, 3rd century BC, Greek Septuagint fragments, 10th century CE, MSS, Masoret, Masoretic. Uh-huh. Text Aleppo Codex. Perfect. 200 BC Dead Sea Scrolls pushed that date back a full thousand years to the second century BC. Okay, so we had, before the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, this silver scroll that you're looking at right there, it has a Levitical prayer on it. Okay, so scriptural writing uh, from the time of Lehi, okay, actually found. And then you have this uh, fragment of uh, Greek Septuagint, and it's, it's just little tiny pieces they found, not entire manuscripts, but pieces, okay, fragments is all they had. And then finally, uh, we, we have the Masoretic text, or the Aleppo Codex, but what year is that? They think that was written about 10th century what? 80. 80. So it's 1,200 years newer than what? Than the Dead Sea Scrolls. The King James Version is thought to have descended okay, from the family of scrolls coming from the Masoretic text. All right? But Joseph Smith's translations and comments in the Book of Mormon don't always match the Masoretic text or the King James Version. So people are like, it doesn't match the oldest version. And then we found an older version in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And Joseph Smith's writings do match in many ways. Tell me someone here why that matters. Why is that interesting to you? Any thoughts? Please. Um, on my mission, one of my favorite people was a 20-year-old convert to the church who had been an Orthodox Jew. Ah. And he came to me one day and he was like, Sister Henry, why don't LDS people read the Hebrew Bible? Because obviously it's more true than the English Bible. And wouldn't God want us to have the truest thing? And I was like, even if it's more true, God wants us to have a completely true thing. So he gave us he was really torn up about how the English Bible didn't match the truth that he thought he had, because he thought his truth was more. And a legitimate question, right? And Would, so this is cool that it yeah. ties back, and it probably does match his beliefs more. Than Thank you. That's beliefs. excellent. And we know the Joseph Smith translation has these kind of insights as well, and the Pearl Great Prize. We also have to remember, though, the Joseph Smith translation, even though we call that, is not exactly a translation. It's more like revelation to the mind of Joseph Smith. Transcription. How many of you think a prophet can comment on scripture and be right? Okay, so I defend that uh, to the end that Joseph Smith was a prophet of God. And if to his mind was revealed greater clarity about the scriptures, I want to read what the modern prophet has revealed. Uh, even though we have old documents, I want to know what the modern prophets say about them. Okay, hopefully this is making sense looking at all the original texts and comparing them and finding out that modern revelation matches many of the ancient insights that were not found uh, in the, the Greek Septuagint, okay, and in some others that were more modern. Um, oh, I, I thought you had to see this. This is interesting. So when did we get these ancient documents, okay? The, uh, the uh, silver scroll I mentioned was not found till when? 1979. So people attacked Joseph Smith for a long time. There's no metal plates with scriptures on them. And, in, around Jerusalem, and then we find them. And people attacked him for uh, not having some insights that are found in the Greek Septuagint version, but that wasn't found until 1939, and then we've made wonderful connections. The Nash Papyrus, which has the Ten Commandments, and the, the Shema Yisrael prayer, which is, you know how the Jews uh, often will wear a little box on their forehead or on their arm? Okay, that has the Shema prayer in it. Here's something interesting. As we've come to understand the details of that prayer, it actually connects with Doctrine and Section 1. Joseph Smith, under the influence of the Holy Ghost, is answering that prayer. She, Jehovah is speaking to Joseph Smith and answering the prayer that all Jews have. I have a dear Jewish friend. 
His name is Ben Shapiro. We travel the Holy Land together pretty much every year, sometimes a couple of times a year. And every time we go there, he'll scratch this long beard of his and go, it, it sounds like him like sounding like King Agrippa. Almost thou persuadest me to join your church. He's always grabbing his beard and asking me questions like, who's the Messiah to Latter-day Saints? And I once said, Ben, open your scriptures. Let's read about the Messiah in the Old Testament, which we did. The more we read, we found that the Messiah would ha be uh, nailed with a nail in a sure place, that he'd be hung upon a cross, that he'd be fed vinegar, that a crown of thorns would be put on his head, that he'd come from Bethlehem. Are you following all this? And Ben finally put his hands in the air and he said, Doug, you're telling me that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah. I said, no, I'm not, Ben. We read it in your Hebrew Bible. And he looked down and he says, this is very convincing. <laughs> this is very convincing. Um, I testify to you that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, the righteous king that was prophesied of anciently. Okay, so cave one and two, the great Isaiah scroll is found, an extra copy of that Isaiah scroll which I think is brilliant, because then they can compare the two. It's almost like Mormon uh, telling us that they were going to make an extra copy okay, of the book of Lehi, right? Uh, it's, it's fascinating. It's like the same God's working in all these stories. Okay? And the pressure against, the, the, again, the, again the, the commentary of Habakkuk and lots of other books, that's all found in that first one. They found the community scroll. Now, this is focused not on LDS theology or scripture, but this is the group of Essenes that are preserving the record. I wanted you to know they have this huge scroll that has a bunch of rules called their Manual of Discipline and Punishments for Not Obeying Their Rules. And one of them that fascinates me is the Qumran community did not believe that anyone had a right to worship in the name of the Lord or give revelation unless a quorum of ten people are together. What do you think of that? Can you get revelation without ten people in the room? Or worship God? It contrasts the statement of Jesus Christ that whenever two or more were gathered together in his name, there his spirit would be also. Would someone read this little LDS perspective on the Qumran sect? Please, Jason. LDS perspective, the Dead Sea Scrolls preserve the earliest known version of the Old Testament, which they laboriously copied, and yet, when the Messiah came to earth, the Qumran sect completely missed his coming. Does anybody get what I'm sharing here? This is like, for me, a profound insight about those who wrote and transcribed these, this, the largest bi Old Testament biblical record and its commentaries known to man. What did I just say about them? Who gets it? If you get it, raise your hand. Please explain your thoughts. Well, <clears throat> so the whole reason they existed was to purify where the Jewish religion had fallen short, right. essentially, right? right? And so we have commented a lot, you know, at least me and my father have talked a lot together about how obviously the Jews would have missed Christ coming because they had become so corrupted and they weren't looking for the right things. But it's interesting that the people that were trying to purify and correct the religion still didn't notice him. Why do you think that is? How could they spend all day copying an Isaiah scroll and when the Savior appears on the scene, they just don't even know who Because they were just copying scrolls the whole time instead of looking for him. Is it possible that we can get so focused on our own goals and tasks in life that we miss the influence of our Heavenly Father in our lives? Is it possible we can get so focused on a calling in the church or our own scholarly endeavors that we miss why we're doing them? Uh, going to school at this university, there's a reason you're here. To provide for a family become educated. Those are the reasons, right? And sometimes we get a little sidetracked. So I thought this was fascinating. Here's some scriptural thoughts about my dear friends. And by the way, you need to know, I love the people of Israel. I deeply love them. I have a lot of friends there. Some friends at Hebrew University that are dear friends of mine that have retired now. One who speaks 10 languages and he jokes whenever we eat together that he's not a good Jew and I'm not a good Mormon. And I said, why are you not a good Jew, Ben? He says, because I eat ham sandwiches and I love it. <laughs> and I said, well, why am I not a good Mormon? He says, because when you're tired, I see you drink energy drinks sometimes. <laughs> and doesn't your religion go against that? And I said, guilty as charged. Anyway. Um, but I have great respect for their reverence for holy things. They begin their study of the Torah at the first day of the year, the Jewish calendar, and they end the last day of the year, and they begin again the next year. They love the scriptures. Okay, this is my dear friend Ben right here, okay? And uh, 
He has a grandmother who died in the Holocaust in the gas chambers at Auschwitz. And he believes that the Messiah will come again and bring his people freedom. And they will build a temple to the Most High God, to the Messiah. Do we agree with that? I, I can easily feel the Spirit when he talks about those kinds of things. So we have much in common with these wonderful people, our cousins in the covenant. If, if you will. And again, this is an actual photograph. My father-in-law was walking behind me at the Orson Hyde Morrow Garden in, in Jerusalem. And this is the moment in my experience with Ben Shapiro. This was like 1980-something. Okay? And he turned to me and he says, Doug, I've much enjoyed what we've talked about, speaking of Jehovah in the Old Testament. But who is the Messiah to your faith? And we spent the next hour reading his scriptures. And then he threw his hands in your memory and said... You're saying Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah. And I said, no, it sounds to me like the biblical record points that way. So someday we will bring the covenant to these wonderful people of faith and commitment and devotion who have uh, set a place setting for Elijah at their table, right? Every Passover and a little child. Remember, Elder Gong spoke about this in general conference. Didn't he send a child out to invite Elijah to come to the feast and so on? These people have the same faith level as we do. They don't have a fullness, and we can give it to them. And the Dead Sea Scrolls may be a segue to getting into a lot of their hearts. Why don't they recognize the Messiah? Ben, would you read this scripture for us, please? Sure. Wherefore, as I said unto you, it must needs be expedient that Christ should come among the Jews, among those who are moved the more are the more wicked part of the world, and they shall crucify him. For thus it beho behooveth our Lord, our God. And there is none other nation on earth that would crucify their God. The Jews were a stiff-necked people, Jacob says. And they despised the words of plainness. Now, that doesn't describe my friend Ben. Make sense? It doesn't describe him. But it does describe those who had keys and authority, or apostate keys, better said, and apostate authority at the time of Christ and in 586 B.C. during Lehi's time. There was a time period where people had rejected Jehovah and they were in apostasy and the Lord says they killed the prophets and so they couldn't understand. Wherefore, because of their blindness, spiritual blindness, came by looking beyond the mark. They must needs fall. And he's taken away the plainness from them and delivered unto them many things which they cannot understand because they desired it. And because they desire it, they do stumble. I, Jacob, am led by the Spirit unto prophesying, for I perceive by the workings of the Spirit which is in me that by stumbling, the Jews reject what? Do you see it there? By focusing on the wrong things, who do they end up rejecting? Who gets it? They reject the Messiah, the very stone of Israel, even Jesus Christ. Uh, so here's something they wrote that I thought, oh boy, they should have known when Jesus came because they wrote this. This is called the Messianic Apocalypse. All right, help me. Let's see if you've learned something already. Which cave did it come from? Say it louder. One, two, three. Four. Cave four. What's the Q? Qumran. Qumran. What's 521? The number of the fragment. Yeah, that's the fragment number. So, okay, so Qumran, cave number four, fragment number 521 is called the Messianic Apocalypse or the Messiah in the last days, okay, or in the, the, the days of when important things happen. Um, one of my favorite Christian writers is a man by the name of Lee Strobel. He was actually an atheist, and he was a uh, legal reporter uh, for a major newspaper, I want to say Chicago, uh, and uh, he had written about all kinds of things that had to do with kind of his belief in atheism. His daughter is saved in a restaurant from choking to death by a Christian woman. And his wife investigates Christianity and gets baptized, drives him crazy. And they have some conflict in their marriage. And she says, well, you're an investigative reporter. Go find out if Jesus is real. Investigate. So for the next three years, he studies the resurrection of Jesus Christ. By the end of three years, he becomes a Christian minister. And here's what he says about these little, this little fragment in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Would someone read this to us? I think we've got about ten minutes. Left. Go ahead, please. The Gospel of Matthew describes how John the Baptist imprisoned Sent his, sent his followers to ask Jesus this monumental question. Are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? So it's like my friend Ben going directly to who? Jesus. To Jesus or John the Baptist and saying, are you the Messiah? 
Is that a pretty important question? Look at how he answers. Keep reading. He was seeking a straight answer about whether Jesus really was the long-awaited Messiah. Through the centuries, Christians have wondered about Jesus' rather enig enigmatic answer. Instead of directly saying yes or no, Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Jesus' response was an allusion to Isaiah 35 and 61. Does anybody understand this quote? If you do, raise your hand. This makes sense to you. Go ahead, please, teach us. I should stop raising my hand. There. <laughs> well, that's just, those are all things that Isaiah had previously referenced that the Messiah would do, as it says in Isaiah 35 and 61. Good. The prophecies of the Messiah are very direct and clear, and Isaiah is the one that talked most about it. So rather than saying, yes, I am, which he obviously is the Messiah, he tells, he just alludes to those exact phrases, because John would have been someone that would have known those verses. Excellent. So basically, Jesus is quoting Isaiah. How would you feel if you're Isaiah in the spirit world watching that? <laughs> They're asking him if he's the Messiah. He says, just read Isaiah. Isaiah's going, close of mine. Right? <laughs> you feel kind of giddy inside. I don't know. Um, but here's something interesting. The dead are raised is not in Isaiah 35 or 61 in the King James Version, but it is in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Hmm. Follow this with me. I bear testimony to you that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. I've been in this uh, tomb, whether here or somewhere near here, is a tomb where Jesus' body was laid, right? And he did come forth from the dead. I will never forget having one of the twelve put his arm around me. After conducting a funeral of his best friend, it was President Ballard, he put his arm around me. When I was a very young bishop, barely 30 years old, he looked in the eyes and said, quote, I really am a witness of the bodily resurrected Jesus Christ. He lives, he said. He's real. And I know him. And then he kind of hugged me sideways and we went on with the funeral. How many of you remember that event in your life? I bear witness to you, he rose from the dead. I was in this particular photograph. I was with the first counselor in the Temple Presidency of the Mexico City Temple. And uh, his son is now a member of the Quorum of the Seven, the other Becerra. And uh, Juan Becerra went inside and he said, Brother Juan, please go in with me. And he held my arm, hermano, por favor, I have so much feelings. He said about going in here. We went in there and he just wept and wept and wept. And then he said, in Spanish, no está aquí, ha resucitado. No está aquí. What did he say? Who speaks Spanish? He's not here. He's not here. I think that's beautiful, okay? Um, but for the, some reason, Jesus included the phrase, the dead are raised, in Matthew, uh, which is conspicuously absent from the Old Testament Masoretic text. It's not in that old text. This is where, uh, you know, fragment 521 from Cave 4 comes in. This non-biblical biblical manuscript from the Dead Sea Scroll collection, written in Hebrew, dates back to 30 years before Jesus was born. It's recorded 30 years before Jesus is on the earth, and he quotes it, but he doesn't have it, okay? Because it's not in the regular Masoretic text. And obviously, Jesus knew it, and John knew it. So apparently, there's some scrolls or some references that they had that aren't, weren't known to mankind until we find this, this uh, cache of, uh, of uh, scriptures. It contains a version of Isaiah 61 that does not include uh, the phrase missing, the dead are raised. This phrase is unquestionably embedded in the Messianic context. Walking out of this uh, this tomb, uh, the last time I was there, I was with uh, this young man who does World of Dance and Dances with the Stars. Any know who uh, Derek Huff is? Is he someone you know? Uh, he's a member of the church, but really wasn't raised in the church because his parents were divorced when he was very young. And I have his permission to tell this story. He's a dear friend of mine. And he said, as he was coming out of the tomb, we had been testifying of Jesus Christ for 14 days. He knelt down, and I was standing right here, and I said, do you mind if I take a picture? He said, sure, I took a picture. And he said, Doug, do you think Jesus may have touched his way coming out of the tomb? I said, I have no idea. He says, I think he did. He says, I don't believe in God, but I, my, my, my soul kind of like vibrating. I feel something here. I think after hearing all the testimonies on this trip, I believe Jesus Christ is real. So maybe he touched the wall. 
when he came out and rose from the dead. That was moving for me to hear him as a quote unquote agnostic, okay? The jury's still out, he doesn't know what he believes yet, saying, but I, something resonated with him that the Savior had risen from the dead. So if you compare, this is Isaiah in the King James here blind eyes open, lame leap. Ears of death open. Good news to the poor. But what's conspicuously missing that's in Luke 7? Someone raise your hand. What's in Luke 7 that Jesus quotes, and it's also in Matthew, but it's not in the Isaiah of the Masoretic text or the King James Bible? Go ahead. Dead raised. Good. Dead raised. Anything else? Cured many. And say again? Cured many. Cured many. And lepers cleansed. The Savior quotes the purest text. It matches what we believe about the Savior. It refers to the wonders that the Messiah will do when he comes. And when heaven and earth will open and, uh, and, and obey him. Uh, so when Jesus gave his response to John, he was not being ambiguous or cryptic at all. John would have instantly recognized his words as a distinct claim that Jesus is fulfilling the prophecies of the Messiah in Isaiah. It would have been very clear to him. Many were healed. I, I want to conclude with just a few thoughts before I show you one last thing here. Um, this young man's name is Wisdom Ovikomu. I want to bear testimony that the same Jehovah, the same Messiah, the same Christ, spoken of in the Dead Sea Scrolls and in the Old Testament and in the Book of Mormon, is alive and is still influencing our lives through the gift of the Holy Ghost. Um, in 2017, I flew to Ghana, Africa, got off the plane, went to a hospital, had a team of surgeons with me. And uh, two foot surgeons had joined my group the day before, and we didn't have our licensing done, so I told them, you can come and observe this trip, but you can't do any surgeries. But bring your documents with you just in case we can get you cleared. We got off the plane, we got to the hospital, we hadn't slept in 34 hours, we're all exhausted. Yes, I was drinking my little energy drink. We walk into the hospital, and there was a mission president from the Cape Coast Mission who was kind of tender and emotional. He'd been there all day and the night before. And he said, we heard a team of surgeons come from America. We hear you're in charge. I have a young man we didn't know, but he was born with this foot upside down and backwards. And he's been hiding it from the church. He came on his mission, and nobody noticed it. I don't know how that's possible. Okay, he's been out six months, and we'd like to help him. Is there something you can do? And I thought, I've got these two foot surgeons. Bryce and Greg Cook here from Cache Valley, okay? Bryce had just got back from being a mission president in Congo, and his son was taking over his surgical practice, and they wanted to work together. I said, but I don't have a clearance for them to work here. I'm really sorry. As I was saying that, <laughs> he says, well, we've already contacted the director of the hospital, and he has the director of, uh, well, the secretary of medicine for the country of Ghana is here. We invited him to come. And he can approve anything medically in the country. And I had in my bag all of their certificates so they get, and their licenses and their degrees and stuff. I gave it to him and he signed off on it. And for two days they did surgeries on this young man. And uh, it was a, it should be a staged operation of the course of about three years to put his foot right. And they did it in three days. And they corresponded with the missionary department and with Elder Stevens uh, of the Quorum of the Twelve and got permission for him to stay in his mission. What am I trying to conclude and share with you? Our Heavenly Father has His fingerprints all over you. He's aware of you. The Messiah is Jesus Christ, spoken of in all holy writ. He lives today, and He still loves to heal and cure and bless. And if you're going through something right now where the healing's not coming, or the blessing's being put off, or you're feeling alone, there is no one who knows better than him what you're feeling. He's the only one who could ever say, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He's the only one on earth that knows what it's like to have that kind of experience. And I bear witness to you, we just scratched the surface of the Dead Sea Scrolls, but I want you to see some connections that matter to Latter-day Saints. Does that make sense? And that the people who actually wrote them missed the Messiah's coming. Raise your hand if you think that's significant. They're in their scriptures every day. They did their come follow me. <laughs> but they missed him when he came. We need to think about are we aligning our lives with true principles as we're studying the scriptures. And I hope that you will 
begin to look at the Dead Sea Scrolls and, and, and take opportunity to learn a little bit about it because we have a God in heaven with all his galactic governance and his cosmic commitment to worlds without end. He cares more about your hopes and your dreams and desires than anything else. Yes, he inspired people anciently to preserve scripture so we could find them later, later and actually show the legitimacy of the work of Joseph Smith. Yeah. But he also wrote just so you can feel the Holy Ghost and make good choices. Um, he will help you to make an impact in the world in your life if you turn to him. And uh, I, I want to just suggest to you, you can go online and look up the Dead Sea Scrolls LDS Perspectives, there's a couple of really awesome videotapes on YouTube, and I'm just going to introduce this really quick to you that will show you the details of the research that our LDS scholars have done on this great Isaiah scroll. And I'll end with just something funny, because I like to end there. Is that okay? Um, Stephanie, would you read this slide to us from the top? Okay. Several readings of Isaiah in the Book of Mormon are supported by the Isaiah scroll. In the King James Version, Isaiah 52 reads, Their fish stinketh because there is no water. And the Isaiah scroll reads, Their fish dry up because there is no water. Okay, so they're different, right? Keep going. 2 Nephi 7.2 essentially preserves the verb stinketh from the King James Version and the, and the phrasal verb dry up from the Isaiah scroll. I make their fish to stink because the waters are dried up. So question, which is the most complete, King James, Dead Sea Scrolls, or Book of Mormon? Book of Mormon. I bear testimony the Book of Mormon was translated by the gift and power of God. Our Heavenly Father reveals the mind of this young man. About your age, who's 24 in here? Who's 24? You're the age when the church was organized. Who's, who's 21? Anybody 21? What happened to Joseph Smith at 21? All right, I'm not going to tell you. You find that out. <laughs> Go back to your saints book and figure that out. At 17, who comes to him? Moroni. How many times does he go to the hill? How many years? Four. All right, you have a clue now? At 21, what's happening to him? The Book of Mormon. He's, he's translating the Book of Mormon at your age. And he's getting the stinky fish part right, too. <laughs> Silly. But scholars will look at that and go... How do you do that? Oh, that plowboy got lucky, right? No, he was a prophet of God that translated by the gift and power of God. Um, Enoch, just really quick. Anybody love the writings of Enoch in the book of Moses? Okay, in the Bible, look at this. There is only a couple of verses in the Bible about Enoch. Genesis 5, 25 and Jude 1, 14. He, he prophesied about the coming of the Lord to execute judgment. And it says, aside from the brief genealogical notes, all the Bible tells us about Enoch is that he walked with God and was not. How many think that's not enough? At the time that Joseph Smith felt inspired to write the books of Moses and tell us all about Enoch, nobody knew that Enoch was a colossus in extra-biblical writings. This is all we had. But ever since then, we've found scrolls in Ethiopia and Syria and in the Dead Sea Scrolls that Enoch has this huge story that you know well because our Heavenly Father